Cool. Yeah. Okay, so I'm Alex, I'm the lab admin. Um, so how many people know about networking? How many people don't know about networking? If you have questions at any point during my networking or NMAP talk, please raise your hand, I'll try to get to you. Um, okay, so uh, networking is a basic five layer structure. Um, you kind of interact with, as the end user, the top two. Um, and you can think of each layer, you know, talking to the layer directly beneath it. Um, at the endpoints, and yeah. Um, so the application layer is the one that you're most familiar with, HTTP, um, how you get your web traffic, um, SMTP, simple mail tra uh, transfer protocol, how you, how you send web. It's, it's the layer that you most use every day, especially when using a browser. Um, the transport layer, which is an, a layer beneath um, the application layer, runs things like TCP and UDP, which are the two main kind of transport layer protocols. Um, and they handle end-to-end -end communications. Um, TCP is stateless, which means, or state, stateful, sorry. Um, which means you have to set up a connection, more on that later. Um, and UDP just kind of sends information as it feels like. Um, and then the IP layer, which is, uh, if anybody's ever heard of a router or routing, um, that happens at layer three. I think Apple Talks layer five. I'm, I don't really know what Apple Talk is. There, there are, but for the most part. ICMP is kind of in the middle in like layer three and two. Well, no, it's really layer three and four. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, its, own thing. it's kind of funky. There are some things that don't quite follow the layered thing. For example, UDP when it's doing a checksum uses a bit of the IP layer, and then it sends it down. So there are layers, but sometimes the lines are a little bit blurry. Um, any other questions? Uh, cool, so this is kind of what uh, you can kind of think of as the uh, you know, hourglass of the internet. So you got your application layer like Firefox and <coughs> Silverlight um, running up top, and they just kind of feed down, um, down the stack. Okay, so the application layer, like we said, uh, you, if you're using a web browser, you interact with the application layer on a daily basis. What? Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, so things like DNS, HTTP run on this layer. Um, transport layer, it, it kind of help, um, it deals with you know end-to-end points like TCP um, handles, and uh, it also um, handles things like congestion control sometimes if you're using TCP. Um, and flow rate. Okay, so I talked about TCP and UDP earlier. Um, here's kind of the main difference. Uh, TCP is connection oriented, which means like if I'm going to talk to a server, I have to, we have to go through this through a handshake. Um, UDP, not so much. You can think of UDP like your mail, uh, like standard mail, if anybody ever uses that these days. Um, so are you just send a, send a, pa send a packet um, and the mail service kind of takes, takes care of everything else for you. And, you know, it's unreliable. So if UDP, if you, as a baseline, UDP, if it drops a packet, it just doesn't care. Um, it has no, no way of recovering that packet, um, unlike, unlike TCP. Um, so for TCP to set up a handshake, um, it, it does a three-way handshake. It, um, it sends us all these like SYN flags, or SYN and SYNAC and ACK, they're actually flags within the TCP packet itself, um, telling each end you know, what type of packet this is in terms of like, oh, am I connecting? Am I you know, acknowledging your request? Um, TCP works off of a set of acknowledgments after a packet gets sent. Um, cool, any, any questions? Did I gloss over anything too quickly? Uh, so the only thing I can think of off the top of my head that you would interact with on a daily basis is uh, domain name service, DNS. Robert? Yeah, things, uh, streaming videos also 
use sometimes use UDP because if you like miss a frame, you don't want to like keep on like hearing sound and wait for that frame to eventually show up. You had a question. Interesting, I didn't know that. Um, also, UDP is a lighter protocol. Um, so for every packet, there's overhead called a header. Um, TCP has a 20 byte header. Um, UDP only has eight. So in terms of packet size, UDP packets are, can be, you know, you can hold more data per, per packet uh, because it has a smaller header. Any other questions? Cool. OK, on the end, pizza. Um, cool, yeah, that was kind of a decent segue uh, for pizza. Anybody want a kiosk mode, their laptop? Okay, cool. So, on the end map, which is network mapping. Um, gee, interesting name. Um, cool. So, host discovery. One of the first things you're going to want to do if you have no idea of the host architecture, or the host network is you're going to want to discover things because how can you scan against something that you don't know is there? Um, so there's a couple options. Um, SL is doing a list scan, which is a reverse DNS lookup. So what it does is instead of having a name and getting an IP address, it has an IP address and tries to get a name back. Um, and, you know, companies sometimes, you know, name them quite useful things like the city they're in or, you know, what network they're attached to. So you get a lot of information off of that, uh, but SL doesn't actually send any uh, packets to the uh, machine. Um, SN is do uh, a host discovery, but don't port scan. So it basically just wants to figure out, okay, am I talking to an actual computer, or am I just hitting, you know, nothing? Um, um, so PN does a host discovery, doesn't scan. Oh. The reason I have SN and PN is different versions of Nmap, those two will be the same thing, but depending on which version you have, that flag will be set or not set. Um, PSPA and PU, they do uh, respectively uh, TCP SYN, TCP AC, um, which were the two parts of the um, three-way handshake, and uh, UDP, uh, just pinging of hosts. And uh, traceroute obviously works how like a normal traceroute would, where you try to find the list of routers to, um, or, inter or hops to your host. Um, so Nmap tries to be as useful as possible with, uh, with its port states. Most will give you open or closed. Nmap tries to make um, guesses about some things um, that most port scanners don't. So there's open and closed, obviously, which are, you know, oh, hey, it's open on port 22, or hey, that's not open. Um, filtered, you get a lot because, you know, firewall rules might obscure um, access to that port, um, depending on TCP, UDP. Um, then there's unfiltered, which is kind of like filtered, but it can't tell. Um, and open filtered, closed filtered is kind of a hybrid between the two. Um, so for the individual scanning options, you have your TCP SYN and connect scan, um, and your ACK scan, um, and as well as UDP. Uh, the reason they give you so many different scanning options is because you're trying to see, you know, what your firewall rules are blocking you against and trying to get around firewall rules. Um, you know, if they have it locked down against TCP, but they for, kind of forgot about UDP, you can use that as, you know, oh, well, let me try a different scanning technique and kind of see what works. Um, there's also B, which is interesting because, uh, does everyone know what FTP is? Okay, um, so the initial FTP servers, you could get them to put another file on a server for you. Uh, turns out you can use that um, usefully against them as a scan, um, which is pretty nice because it's already passed whatever firewall, potentially. So it's doing the scanning for you and just giving you the results back, um, which is nice. Um, 
Okay, so picking ports, which we actually care about, because that's where the services are running at. Um, so the default is to do 1,000 in a random order. Uh, random being important because the more random you are, uh, the less likely you will be to trip off any intrusion detection systems or protection systems that'll you know, raise you know, suspicion about what you're doing. Um, because the whole point of port scanning is to be uh, sneaky. Um, so F does even less, it's fast scan. Uh, R makes them sequential, why you'd want that, I don't know. Um, and P, which is the most useful option, gives you like a range of ports. So if you want one through a thousand, you would do dash P one dash a thousand to tell scan port one to a thousand uh, inclusive. Um, now the interesting thing, uh, operating system detection. So you have a bunch of uh, computers that you don't have, like you don't know what operating system they're running, um, and you want to find that out. Um, so how Nmap does is, is it, everybody implements the TCP stack a little bit differently. Um, the last time we live demoed this with Wireshark, it sent about 10,000 packets to uh, the, the scan server that we were trying to figure out. Um, and it gets a fingerprint back of, you know, different things and it has a database that it compares against and it'll give you kind of like rough estimates of oh I think this is Linux or oh yeah it's definitely Windows um, and you can obviously uh, figure out you know how many times you want to try before you just give up because operating system scanning is kind of a noisy activity any questions Um, yeah, so port scanning technically is legal, but it's one of those things that if it's not your network and you don't have express permission, you shouldn't at any cost do. Um, it's very suspicious because that's, you know, you kind of have to fingerprint before you can attack. So, you know, they're going to be, um, you know, you might raise some suspicion. Uh, it probably violates acceptable use policy of like every network that has one. Um, so, like everything else, do it if you only have permission. Um, so it doesn't really deal so much with that as it's, um, rep because it'll convert everything to a uh, host order, which is big Indian. Yeah, it just depends. Like, like initial sequence numbers, um, which is a really big value. So, you want to get to you one second. Um, so you want to make it a your initial sequence number is is so. Um, you don't send packets, or so you know which packet you're sending, and so you don't, um, like, so you can figure out that, okay, yes, I've sent this packet, or oh, this just took a really long time to get here, I need to drop it because I already asked for another one. It basically differentiates your packets, and different operating systems will choose different base values for those. I think there are also a bunch of other things. Other things as well. You can look it up on their website. Oh, definitely. Um, so this, this will really only work on somebody who is in the operating system without running any of the public key on the server. So basically someone who just lets everything into all the traffic. Well, not necessarily that. Like, usually people won't be able to think, like, the, the bulk transfer value of the packet. So you have to kind of, like, figure out what that packet is. Or you have to I mean, do, 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 do
It's a pain. And in that case, set your firewall rules appropriately. Uh, potentially, yeah, depending on how much of a difference there is. I haven't really, I can't give you empirical numbers. I mean, I guess if you want to be really obscure, you can. operating system things you have bigger things to worry about uh, than just like oh they know I'm running like Ubuntu version 4 <laughs> MAP has a lot of different ways you can tune it um, to, you know, try to get past intrusion detection, um, reduce the, or if you want to, you know, reduce the amount of time you're actually scanning. So, um, so you can do minimum host group and max host group. So um, it kind of divides the, like if you're scanning like a slash 16, which is 65,536 computers, you can figure out like, oh, well, I want no more than 24 to be uh, in a group at one time to be scanned. Um, it, it just helps you like fine tune your scan settings, um, along with minimum and maximum parallelism, uh, the number of probes that you can, like. So MAP will send out like probes, which are basically just um, packets to the end user, and you can specify like, oh, I want no less than ten or no more than you know fifty. Once again, fine tuning, um, and the max retries and host timeout are, are similar. Where you know I'm not going to try fifty times on this one server because that gets kind of suspicious. Um, rate. Oh, T, T is one of the more important settings. Um, if you don't want to go through all of this fine tuning, but you want to set a general thing. Um, so you have your T settings, or six of them. Um, obviously, or you can go T, T1 through zero through five. Uh, five being, you know, more, more, you know, faster. Um, but that also increases your risk of getting caught. Um, so now on to output. OG turns um, things into grepable output. Um, if anybody doesn't know what grep is, like say you have a long document and you want to find all lines that have the word, oh, I don't know, puppies or a certain regular expression, like password equals. Um, this, this output turns it in a way so you can easily just kind of grep for the lines that you want. Um, it's deprecated in favor of XML, which um, there's several reporting tools I know of. One is uh, Magic Tree that will allow you to do, you know, reports on, you know, findings from an MMAP scan. Um, here's an example of kind of what it looks like. Um, so, and there's other miscellaneous things. Um, packet trace prints a summary of every packet. Uh, it's a lot of information. Um, and uh, script kitty output. Why, it's just kind of a funny thing. Um, it's not really useful. And so it, it kind of turns things into like elite speak if like 1337 and like it common transforms, like it'll use like a dollar sign instead of an S and things like that for, for all the anons out there. Um, this is what? I guess, I don't know. S somebody in the open source community was having some fun. Um, so yeah, okay, there's my bibliography. Um, 
And I'm going to get on to uh, live demonstrations. But the other cool thing that I didn't get to um, in the slides was Nmap has a scripting engine. So Nmap, as it is, is a highly parallelizable way of sending packets out to things. Hmm, I could probably script that and do some interesting things with it. Like, uh, does anybody know what slow loris is? OK, so for those of you that don't know what slow loris is, it's a way of um, trying to exhaust all the resources on Apache um, by sending fragmented, was it post or git requests? Anybody? I can't remember. Um, but basically, you send out these uh, fragmented HTTP requests. So Apache's like, OK, I got the first half. Where's the second half? And then it like accepts more and more of these. And then you've just kind of like hogged all of its connections and memory. And it just crashes. Um, Yes and no. You have to set up what's called a stateful firewall, and you know really kind of get your rules tuned correctly. Um, anybody? Everybody tried to download Nmap at the same time, or rather tutorial, and they thought we were dosing them. No. That was, yeah. Um. But yeah, another thing you can do is if you don't want to crash the server, you can just, what's called a wave DDoS, is um, another tool that attackers will use. And they'll just kind of get it kind of close to crashing, like within the last 25%, and they'll just kind of keep it there. So, you know, it, it's slowing down the web server so much that all legitimate traffic is getting slowed down as well. So it's making their website render ridiculously slow. And if we know anything about internet users, they have, you know, a, a uh, attention span of about two seconds when it comes to shopping um, in terms of page load time. So they don't have to take down the web server. They just have to slow it down to the point where it makes traffic kind of really, really long to load. Uh, so sin cookies prevent against what's called uh, uh, sin flood, where what happens is like you'll set up half of a TCP connection and just walk away. Um, yeah, okay. so that's right. so, so this, that's so this, is, this is essentially the same attack, but on a higher layer. So you're making a full TCP connection, but you're sending a fragment of an HTTP request. And the firewall, in order for the firewall to go Denial of service attacks aren't just on the network either. Uh, sure, you have network level denial of service attacks, but you also can you know, <coughs> consume all of the resources on the local machine to deny service to other applications that are trying to, to get them. So, uh, DOS is certainly not. Um, not dead by a long shot, and Anonymous uses both uh, low orbit ion cannon and slow loris to uh, fairly high success rates on a fairly regular basis. Don't those require like lots of other willing participants to act? You also know the sheep, and you, they yeah. do, and they have them. But, and, but I mean, a distributed denial of service attack is by definition distributed, so yeah, DGOS is. So the, is that the, the other thing is that an attack like this could be launched by someone who owned the bot. No, I am. So they have the malware all over the place, and they're so 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 computers. They can make all of those computers send these requests without the So, on the note of DDoS, um, or denial of service, as Chris has defined it, um, in IPv6, routers do um, advertisements that say, hey, I'm a router. You should join my network. Um, Mac, Linux, and a bunch of other operating systems handle large amounts of them properly, um, aka spoofing of them. Windows doesn't. So if you send about 1,000 to a Windows machine, it'll try to join all of them. And your CPU processor will spike to 100 and not come down for quite a while, because it's trying to join every single network. Not that. Uh, the ping of that is oh. back, or was back for a little while, like uh, about a month ago. 
So the thing of death was a UDP packet. Um, it, it was small enough that one UDP packet, which is kind of a small amount of information in terms of payloads, managed to crash an entire computer. Uh, Robert, you got a question? Either. Like, for example, you could have a server which um, uh, handles Unicode, but its Unicode processing uh, like takes more time than usual. So if you send it like lots of weird Unicode strings, like it's perfectly legitimate input, but you're making it take a lot of unnecessary processing time. Also, uh, things a lot of the times if they don't set their limits correctly. Depending. Yeah. So. Um, so the Nmap scripting engine um, is uh, done with Lua, if anybody's heard of that. Um, it's a really lightweight language. Uh, if you've ever done Warcraft, World of Warcraft mods, they're all written in Lua. Um, so you can do a lot of interesting things. Last time I gave this talk, there were about 80 scripts. When I checked it today, there were about, oh, I don't know, 1,000. Um, and you can do anything from, you know, Looking at a robots.txt file, which tells a web spider what not to crawl, like Google not to show this, um, to launching Slow Loris itself. Um, to get there, you would go. Um, you just type nmap scripting and go to the second link, nmap scripting engine. And there you just have, um, hmm, wow. That's not what I wanted. Um, sorry. Fourth one down. Um, and look how small that bar is. Um, there's things like banner, which is cool. So um, things will have a banner like um, Apache has a banner on um, their service, and you can fingerprint, if they don't change it, um, what version of Apache is running. Um, some of the other cool ones are uh, based on HTTP. I've been kind of playing around with them. Um, but yeah, there's basically anything you want under the sun. Um, things like find my iPhone enabled iOS devices. Um, that looks interesting. Um, there's things like Joomla and you can brute force HTTP sessions, or not HTTP sessions, uh, HTTP authentication. Uh, figure out what HTTP methods there are. Um, there's more than just get and post and some of them can do interesting things like trace. Um, you can steal credentials with trace like cookies. Um, you should disable it. Um, but yeah, there's a lot. Look at what's out there. It's pretty cool. Um, OK, so um, sweet. I have two boxes here. This is uh, a Linux box running Apache. And this is everybody's favorite, Metasploitable. Uh, if you haven't heard of Metasploitable and you want to learn Metasploit, this is the box to do it on. Um, Yeah, so it's an OS that's running, uh, actually, let's uh, F full screen. Um, so I know that this is running on 10. I know it's a bad IP. I, I kind of cheated. Um, but um, since this, I could have a lot of IP ranges. Um, so let's see what it's running. Um, So, oh, hold up. Can everybody see that? Okay, so basically what I've done is I've told nmap with nmap. Uh, I've given it a target, 10.0.2.14. Um, SV does version detection on a lot of things. Um, and dash P specifies the port number. Um, so in here I'm doing ports 1 through 1,000. Um, oh, another interesting thing to note about scanning is they take kind of Sometimes a long time. <laughs> Was it Control Shift Plus? I seem to have lost everything. Okay. Um, so I'm starting Nmap. I'm scanning a thousand ports. Uh, this shouldn't take too too long, uh, empirically speaking. Okay. So we get some nice information. Um, so from the from the bat, we can see that we're running uh, on port 21, an FTP server, um, and you can see what version it is. Um, 
MMAP does versioning kind of like it does uh, OS versioning. Um, it has a large database. Um, okay, so that's that's you know kind of cool. You can see you know what's running. So if you like you're running looking through the Metasploit uh, things after you figure this out, you can tell like oh it's running version two. Uh, are there any exploits running for version two? Um, oh, and if you forget all of this, just type nmap and it gives you a just a giant list of uh, you know every you know lots of different uh, options that it has. Um, so if I wanted to go ahead and see what operating system it's running, I can just go tell it to go do an. Oh yeah, some of these require root privileges because of what packets you're sending. So uh, so that's known as uh, bang bang. So uh, do you see where I had? Um, I was getting there. It's useful. It's one of those things that I use like every time I use a command shell. Um, I don't think it does anything by itself. I don't actually remember. You can do what? Exclamation asterisk. Huh, I didn't know that was a lot. Yeah, and uh, I know I actually. Yeah, exclamation dollar sign gets just the last argument. Hmm. Interesting. Useful stuff. Meta characters, yeah, yeah. Back ticks are fun. Okay, so, cool. We have some interesting information. We know it's one hop away, which means there's one thing in between me and the target server, or target, uh, target machine. Um, once again, it does some fingerprinting of some things, but it doesn't give you the version of them, uh, like, the, like the last one did. The last one gave you the version. This one, on the other hand, does not. Uh, but it will tell you what it is, or you know, basically what it is. Um, so the cool thing you can do are like HTTP scripts, uh, or sorry, scripts. Um, so that's accessed by dash dash script equals, uh, there's one called HTTP headers. And since I, I only know that there's an HTTP server running on port 80, because there's nothing running on 443, I'm just going to tell it, hey, just hit port 80. Um, because that's the only thing that's going to return an HTTP result, or at least based on these, uh, based on the scan results. Should. Um, scanning never takes as long as you think it will. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So we got, you know, the date, what server it's running. Uh, oh, it's got Apache. Um, powered by PHP, yay. Um, so yeah, I did a head request. Um, you can also get HTTP. Uh, you can also figure out what HTTP methods there are. There's more than just get and post. There's get, post, put, delete, uh, trace. Um, Basically, if you aren't going to use them in a web application, disable them because there's some interesting attacks you can do. With, at least I know of trace you can do interesting things with. Um, Robert? Um, well, options is needed for Ajax, I believe. Options? Yeah. So oh. you pretty much just need get posts and options. OK, yeah. There's Apache implements something called lock, which if I think it does what it does, you can kind of deny service to people. Um, I'm not sure what, what exactly that does. but. Um, so it says no allow or public and options. I don't actually know what that means. Um, it doesn't say get or put. Um, other interesting things you can do is uh, find out if a web application firewall is in the way. Uh, so web application firewall tries to defend the web app against like cross-site scripting attacks and SQL injection um, and things of that nature. 
Um, let's see if there's anything else. Uh, cool. That's that's about all I've got for now. Any any questions? Say that again. Uh, on what? If you wanted to close all your ports, you do that. Maybe you'd have to spoof the source address or the other person's address. Well, Steve, you're saying you want to kill an ongoing TCP connection? Like, you know, the sequence numbers are So like if A is connected to B and I'm computer C, so like. No. I don't think you're going to feature that. You might be able to script it. Yes. Where am I going to know that? Wouldn't you have to sniff traffic though to figure out the other person? Are you talking about like if A and B? And you're trying about killing this connection? What? I don't think so because you have to sniff traffic to know their sequence. I don't know, Nick, you know more about TCP than I do. You can spoof your MAC address, and yeah, you can spoof. Uh, under miscellaneous options, there should be spoofing. Um, if you've, so routers have some defense against that. If you've already come off as one IP, and then you try to spoof another one, your router will be like, yo, like, back off. Like, no. Uh, it works the same way for MAC addresses, although we had two computers connected to the same router. I'm not sure if that was just because it was a local network issue. And if you get past that, I don't know. But we ran into that problem last time where I couldn't spoof my MAC address because I was connected to a router which is connected directly back to uh, somebody else's computer. So it depends. You should, I mean, you could spoof your MAC address on your own box. Um, but yeah, so your, the router might also defend against that. So you just got to watch out for that. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, Again, Alex, for, for picking up a uh, short amount of time, uh, you know, I'll give our presenter another round of applause. Um, so, uh, like the speaker is going to be um, stacking them, and they're going to be talking about something called fixed line security, which I'm not entirely sure what that is, but uh, it sounds pretty awesome. And uh, I know oh, the last, so cool. last time they uh, they presented was pretty pretty great too. Uh, so. I know that uh, it might have come as a surprise to some of you that it was inaugurations instead of elections today. So I'd like to give all of the new admins a uh, minute if they'd like to come here and talk about why they're excited for their position or what they plan on doing, changes they'll bring, why we should all be excited about the future, any of the above. So if any of you guys want to come up here and do so, you guys can prepare talks for this. Speech, speech, speech. Yeah, I heard talk and they said what you found. She's talking okay. English. She's talking English. Okay, yeah, they're talking. Wait, I saw that. I can fill however much time you need to fill. Alright. Okay, so. Um, where this is gonna work. So, yeah, I'm really excited about uh, next year. Um, being the president of Grey Hat. Uh, so I, I have a whole bunch of ideas uh, for how we can make the club better and how we can uh, get you know, more, more people involved and get the people who are involved uh, more experienced and you know, more, more capable of uh, understanding all the security stuff that we're, we're talking about. Um, and I think, um, so I'm, I'm really kind of thinking of it as, as two separate 
things that we really need to do uh, next year. One of them is, you know, we, we started out the year with like 100 plus people, which was absolutely ridiculous. And I don't think, I don't think that's necessarily a goal uh, to have so many people. I think the number of people we have here uh, is really great. Um, and, you know, having, having 20 or 30 people who really love being in Grey Hat is better than having 100 people who, you know, just are like, we let's go to Grey Hat um, and get, get free pizza or something. Um, so I, I, think, I think it's, you know, it's great that we have the number of people we have, uh, but I think we can also have a, a wider influence here at the College of Computing. Uh, and one of the things that I want to do to help that, um, and also to address one of the issues of, you know, I've, I've had a lot of people come to me and be like, oh, Ray Hat sounds really cool, how, I, I, but I don't know anything about security, I don't know anything about, you know, networking or, or how to use, use Linux, um, and so how, where do I start? And uh, I mean, really, really the best I, I've been able to say is, oh, you can come to these talks. We, we have interesting stuff that people are talking about. Um, and you can, you can come to labs and stuff. But there's really no way, there, there's no mecha mechanism that we have to get people up to, to speed on you know, how, how to use Linux effectively and how to do all of these basic networking things. Because so many of our talks have to do with uh, networking basics uh, and how, how you use all of these different tools. Um, and one of, so the thing I want, I want to try and do is have a short kind of crash course that is taught by, I guess, great hat officers or if anybody uh, wants to help uh, do that. Um, a crash course in how to, how to use, you know, the Linux command line effectively. Like there, there are so many things that you can do with Bash that I, I mean, I learn things all the time. Uh, about different features that you can use with Bash, different different things you can do on the Linux command line, and there's really no nice way of learning all those things. Like the when I when I talk to people who know all these things about how to use you know Linux effectively or use these special tools, they kind of have just learned them through osmosis, just by like you know listening to people who know what they're talking about, and eventually they know what they're talking about, and people listen to them. Um, and I think <laughs> I think it would be great if we can if we could you know condense some of this knowledge and uh, come up with kind of a baseline that everybody should understand before they can, you know, really understand how, how all these talks work so that everybody, we can raise everybody up to a certain level where everybody's going to understand a lot of the things that we're, we're talking about so we can have more, more advanced talks as well as help out the College of Computing in, gen in general because, you know, there's, even, even though um, we expect a lot of people, you know, if you've, if you've taken 2110, you probably know what I'm talking about, where they just kind of throw Linux at you, and you're like, how do I use this? It's like, write a bunch of C code in it. It's like, okay. And nobody, nobody really understands how to use a lot of the, the nice features of, of Linux and of a lot of things like that. So I think, I think we can get a lot of people, we can attract a lot of people with a program like that so that everybody, even if they're not necessarily interested in Grey Hat, they can at least be exposed to the kind of stuff that we do and learn that we're the sort of people who know how to get this stuff to work. Uh, and that, that hacking is really, you know, even though there's all of this, this cool stuff that you do with exploits and everything, a lot of it really comes down to understanding how to use your tools correctly. Um, so that's, that's one thing I want to do. In addition, I'm really excited about uh, how well we've been doing so far with Capture the Flag games. Um, you know, the, the CTF competition stuff that we've been doing, particularly the, the Seesaw competition. Uh, I mean, we, we got, like, <coughs> top, you know, somewhere in the top ten in the country, or country plus Canada. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and and that's, that's amazing. Like, we, we, that was a first-year thing. And I, I really hope that we can, we can do that again and we can go even further, um, especially because it, it was such a, you know, kind of out-of-the-blue thing. And I think what we really need to do in order to repeat that is, is make sure that we're, uh, we're really doing, you know, useful kind of training exercises uh, when we're during the, the Capture the Flag meetings and, and everything like that. Um, because, I mean, it, it seemed like the people, the people who ended up going to the finals were people who kind of understood how to use all the, the tools already, and they, they didn't really learn all that much from Grey Hat itself. And I think it would be really great if we can, you know, have Grey Hat be a place where you can actually learn to get to that level, where we can actually get people up to that level. And I think the way that we do that, instead of having, because, you know, it, a, a structured thing is, is nice if you want to get everybody to this base level, but security is far too big to actually have some sort of course like that. I think we really need to focus on, the, on, on running our own challenges and getting the infrastructure up so that we can run those challenges effectively. Um, 
So if somebody wants to set up some sort of crazy network topology and we have to break into it and do something, something crazy so that we can all experience how you would actually do something like that in real life. Um, if, we, if we can get in a sort of infrastructure like that up, uh, that, that's a really important thing. So I think kind of both of those things are, are my goals, at least for uh, next semester. Um, and I think the, the team of officers that uh, we're going to have is, is really great for that. Um, I mean, it's, it's really an all-star team. Uh, so. How do you plan on doing sort of a crash course there? Is it going to be like, uh, like just once uh, like 10 minutes out of every meeting? Or are you going to do like So this, this would be something, yeah. So I, I think uh, it, it's good to have an actual physical meeting uh, where it would happen. So this would probably be, uh, in addition to the lab meetings that we're having, we would have it. I, I think what, what is really ideal is we want to have people able to come to it even if, um, so I want, I want it, sorry. So I want it to be something relatively short, so it'd probably be only about four weeks, um, but it would be some sort of intensive thing where we'd have a lot of, a lot of the materials up online, uh, and we would go through exercises with people each of the weeks, and we'd have very, you know, a, a very strict set of things that we want to teach people. Uh, and we, we run it multiple times a semester, so if somebody's like, oh man, I learned all this cool stuff, at this this gray hat you know Linux crash course, um, and you know their their friends like oh man I, they're already halfway through we can't you know I can't join in so if we're if we're running it multiple times a semester we can we can sort of build up a, a set of things that we do we can build up materials and stuff the first semester or the first time we go through it and it should be relatively easy to continue. Um, I haven't actually seen those, but. Right, yeah, that, that would be the idea. Um, so it would be something that, you know, anybody, anybody could take, uh, but would be relatively difficult, um, just sort of a real crash course. Like, you, you would focus for just a couple weeks if you, you know, your, your classes are slow for some period of time. Because I know, I know classes, they sort of, they're like easy, and then they're extremely hard, and then they're easy again, and it's all over the place. And if you just want to fit something in in the middle. Yeah? All right, that's a good question. But, um, <laughs> what about, uh, like, maybe helping prepare people to do certifications or something like that? Because I know, I know mm -hmm. there are certifications out there for this right. kind of thing, and they help you find jobs and that sort of stuff in this area. Um, I don't really know what they are, mm -hmm. but I think that'd be kind of cool. Right, I think, I think that's definitely something we could try and do in the future, but it's a, kind of a big undertaking. And then there's also the issue of which certifications would we target? Because there are a lot of them, and some of them are tied to companies, some are tied to different types of things that may not really be information security um, that, that people may still want to try and do. I think, I think that's a little bit out of scope. Like, if we really just have this sort of single thing that we do at least at first, um, I think that'll work better. So uh, just just to add to that, um, I think that uh, defensive security would probably be open to um, giving us reduced rates for some of their certifications. And I can say right. from, from what I've seen on, on the one that I'm working on, uh, they're very good in terms of what, what they teach you. So if, if you're interested in certification stuff, you know, I, I'm definitely going to look into that and see if we can get reduced rates for those because uh, they definitely seem like they're valuable. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, but not, not as, so my, my point is as like a, an official club thing that we're doing, right. it would be a little bit out of scope to try and, you know, organize. I mean, we can, we can at least facilitate people getting these certificates, but uh, it's a little bit too much for us to try and do that ourselves. I really just, I want something where, you know, if somebody comes to me and says, oh man, I really want to be in Gray Hat, how do I learn all this stuff? I can be like, go to this place and do this and have a, a real concrete answer to that. I hear that you are putting up like a cloud for Gray Hat. Is that true? Yeah. So we're one thing that we're trying to do. Uh, you know, Jake and I uh, are are planning for next year um, is to try and make our computing resources a little bit more flexible uh, because we really need to in order to run these crazy challenges and stuff uh, and to have them up for longer, have more more virtual machines in them. Uh, we really need something that's a legitimate kind of cloud infrastructure. Uh, where we can bring things up and take them down and provision different resources to different people so that they can do things in parallel. 
Um, so we're going to be trying to set up OpenStack on the hardware that we have right now, at least the hardware that can support virtualization, because we have stuff on Rackspace at the COC. We haven't actually been using it because we haven't been able to configure it completely. Um, it's, it's just sort of a combination of uh, firewall issues and uh, that we just kind of, we haven't had the time to, to get all of the things up and running. Uh, so we, we really want to utilize that hardware more. In addition, uh, I'm also trying, I'm, I'm thinking of trying to get, uh, get it so that the lab is more open, because um, currently we just have labs on Mondays and they're sort of something specific. Uh, but I'd like it to be a little bit more like how Make is run, where the, the lab is open more of the time and people are able to do projects. Considering that we have an absolutely massive stack of servers up in the Gray Hat lab, uh, we actually have like 20 servers up there that are doing effectively nothing. Um, right, so the, the problem with them is that they don't have virtualization extensions, so we can't run any sort of cloud stuff on top of it. They're just not capable. They also don't have that much memory. But for something like, you know, if you wanted to start up a project, you wanted to try, you know, running, running like a fuzzing cluster or something, and you wanted, you wanted to try and, you know, test out, you know, breaking some password hashes or something. Like if you, if you have a project that would require some computing resources, we have a whole pile of computing resources. We just haven't been able to provision them up and, you know, or we haven't been able to provision them is the problem. Uh, so I'm, I'm thinking of trying to make it a little bit more open so that people can, you know, if you, you have some idea or you have some reason that you might want to use some server infrastructure stuff, uh, then that stuff will be available. Yeah, um, also has, it's going to be surplusing a handful of 100 megabit uh, managed switches, Cisco. But once it just got sucked out of production, 100 megabit managed Cisco switches what? with fiber cool. connections. Nice. Yeah. Oh, there's the one that's like from the, uh, the one that we set stuff right, right. Yeah. 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 yeah, that would be cool. Yeah, yeah I mean, so for, I for, right. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the main issue is we have all of this hardware, but we don't have anything to do with it specifically. Like, it's, it's far too slow to set up, set up CTF challenges using physical hardware like this. And it's too fragile, like if you break one of these, or you, you screw up the configuration of one of these things, you can't have like saved it as a virtual machine or something. You, you really have to you know, install another operating system on it that takes another hour. Um, yeah? So yeah, that, that was, <laughs> right, exactly. Um, so in, in my capacity as a technical officer right now, uh, I'm working to get all of this stuff set up. Uh, we're, we're trying to simultaneously get the sort of cloud infrastructure working on the, the machines that are able to support virtual machines, uh, as well as some sort of automated provisioning system for the other servers so that we can do something like, you know, clone, clone a version of Ubuntu to all of the systems at once or to a, a set of them. So if you want to, you know, run a project and you know exactly what operating system you want on all of the boxes, we can be like, bam, there you go. Um, and there, there are tools out there that let you do that. Uh, you know, Clonezilla, things like Puppet or Chef, um, are able to automatically install packages and everything on, on machines like that. And we, we just need to get stuff like that set up. Yeah? Well, so, yeah, I, I think it sort of depends on what it's for, but currently there doesn't seem to be that much competition for what to do with the servers. Um, it, we'll, we'll figure out exactly how to provision stuff like that once we have it all set up. Um, Right, yeah, yeah. So something like a challenge, uh, it would probably work even better just on a virtual machine. Um, it, it, it sort of depends on the, the scale. But yeah, so, so once we're hosting our own Capture the Flag challenges for internal stuff or for external stuff, uh, then we can definitely host things like that um, on virtual machines and have them public. Any other? Any yeah, other uh, comments, questions coming? Adam wants to say anything. Oh, yeah. Um, lots of specification like that. Well, the certification point, as far as we said, was a particular thing to expect. So the, the group that makes Backside Linux, the Linux security, they have a handful of um, certifications that they offer courses for. Uh, the one that I'm going through right now is called Cracking the Perimeter. And it's, uh, it's, so one of the um, issues that a lot of people take with certifications in the security industry is that they uh, show that you can read a book and then fill out some answers, which 
uh, when you're actually doing hands-on stuff like this, it, that, that's insufficient to show, uh, to show that you're actually good at what you're doing. Uh, you actually need to know, you, know, you need to internalize it, you need to have, be able to actually run it on a machine instead of talk about it from a theoretical perspective. And so the process for actually getting the certification for, for cracking the perimeter is they give you access to a corporate looking network and they tell you to get into it. And gets, yeah, they, they, I don't believe they tell you what files you're looking for, but the idea is you have to figure out, you have to assess the network, figure out where you're going, figure out how to get on it, and, uh, and it's primarily focused on reverse engineering and, uh, and binary exploitation. Um, and the actual course they have is like nine or ten modules that are about like an hour long a piece, and they give you access to a full lab that you can, you can test all the stuff on. So uh, they're expensive, but they seem to be um, good in terms of, of the benefit you get. Yeah, but I so so I would like to get discounted. Um, packages for them because I don't think they're really within. The only reason that we have a number of members doing them is because we won certifications in a competition last semester. So they're, you know, like one of them's like $1,500. So they're a bit pricey. Um, the other thing that's really good about it too is that uh, they require you to document everything that you find and write like a comprehensive report, which is really important, you know, if you have to get a real job with demonstrate to an executive why they have a problem with the software. Right. <coughs> yeah, I mean, and that's... Yeah. So... <laughs> Was that a five-minute presentation? Yeah. <laughs>